and welcome to Opwell's Field Notes, a podcast created by Operation Wallacea to share stories and insights from our 25 years working in the field. My name is Sophia Wood, Opwell's Country Manager for Ecuador and Director of Friends of Wallacea, and I will be your host for this series. We launched this podcast to shine a light on the world of biodiversity field research and the work of those who dedicate their lives to understanding and protecting our planet. Each month, we have conversations with scientists, community conservationists, and experienced academics about new research, protecting biodiversity, and daily life out in the field. Our guest today is Alex Tozer, Opwal's Director of Operations. Before joining Opwal, Alex studied psychology, not expecting to become a field expedition leader. He participated as an Opwal volunteer for the first time in 2004, working in Honduras for one summer and, in his own words, becoming addicted to the conservation research expeditions that make this organization tick. Today, Alex is a licensed bird ringer, wildlife photographer, emergency first response instructor, and most importantly, the person who makes sure all the Opwal expeditions go off without a hitch. He has also played a critical role in expanding Opal's focus during the pandemic to include many new projects, including providing income to local partners through reforestation and carbon credit initiatives around the world. We discuss Opal's reforestation efforts in Sulawesi, how carbon credits work, and how planting trees can support people, animals, and the planet on this episode of Opal's Field Notes. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Opal Field Notes podcast, Alex. It's a nice to uh, no switch spots, actually, after I after you interviewed me on the XC2 lecture a few months ago. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to interviewing you today. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I've forgotten about that. That's that's excellent. Um, nice to nice to be in the other in the other seat. Although I'm a little bit more nervous uh, this way around, funnily enough. Well, hopefully, nothing to be nervous about. The questions <laughs> won't be won't be too much like an interrogation this time. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. All right. So since we're taping everything from home today, where are you based right now? Uh, so right now um, I'm in my house uh, in uh, a little village um, in Lincolnshire, um, surrounded by kids' toys and with my ever-growing poor lockdown haircut. Yes, I think we all have a bit of a, a lockdown haircut coming <laughs> on. Um, it's awful. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> well, could you tell us a little bit more about your role at Opwal and, and really what inspired you to start working in conservation? Sure. Um, so I'm the operations director for Opwal. Um, so my job really is about um, strategy, the strategic direction of the of the organization, uh, making sure that we're running things safely and smoothly, but also that the, the company as a whole is functioning properly. So everything from, you know, making sure that the um, that, that people understand what they're supposed to be doing through to the having a, a sensible company hierarchy and a sensible system throughout the throughout the business. So um, it, it, it's quite broad reaching. Um, and for your question of how did I get involved in conservation, I um, like quite a lot of people, I, I sort of came at it from a, an alternative route, I suppose. Um, I was I've, I had the chance to, to volunteer as a staff member for Opwal in Honduras in 2003 in the summer. And so I, I did that. I saw this opportunity to go out and be an administrator in Honduras. And I had no idea where Honduras was or what an administrator would be doing. But I, I, I got an interview um, and I went out to Honduras for that summer. Um, and it was just incredible. Um, I was studying psychology before that. And I did my master's in psychology, occupation, occupational psychology afterwards. But I had the, the opportunity to finish my master's and go and start working for, for Opwal. And it was one of those points where, you know, you, you think, well, if I, if I don't try this, if I don't do this very non-corporate, you know, different lifestyle to the one that I was sort of anticipating going for, um, then I'll always wonder what if. And it's just been, you know, an amazing experience for me. I've, you um, know, since, since doing it in, I started working for Opwal in 2005. Uh, and since then, I've, you know, enjoyed my job pretty much every day um, since, since, since starting. Well, that's impressive. I would imagine there's a bit of stress involved with uh, managing <laughs> the summer expeditions and everything else that Opwald does. It's not a, not a low risk job. Um, no, definitely not. Definitely not. I, I think, I think that um, when you're, when you're working in conservation, what it tends to do is it, it puts this sort of rosy haze on a lot of things. Cause like any, any career you have things about your job that are, uh, are not great that you don't like and there's politics and there's problems and there's stress but I think if you're doing something that fundamentally you believe in and has a has a good purpose then you, you're a lot more forgiving of those 
um, of those problem aspects. I think that's a good perspective to put on it. And I'm sure you have a lot of uh, tidbits of wisdom after many years working with Opwall. Um, before we get What's into tidbits, kind of... I'm not sure if they'll be wise or not. But I've got some. <laughs> so before we get into kind of the meat of the interview, we'll obviously we'll be talking a lot about carbon credits and reforestation. I wanted to ask you, what's the coolest or craziest thing you've seen in the field throughout your years with Opwa? Wow, that's a tricky one. There's there's so many you know amazing experiences. I, I think you know in terms of cool things, then um, I was in I was in Mexico one summer and, and driving back from picking up some students from a from a bat survey late at night, uh, and this puma walked right out in front of the the car and it was we were, we were must have been 20 meters from the camp it was just incredible and this thing just you know was was right there um i've had quite a lot of you know those sort of close encounters with with wildlife when i was in south africa we got i was uh, again in a, a truck i was driving and we got charged by by black rhino which is really exciting um because you, know, you hardly ever see black rhino and then one of them sort of did a, a mock charge and then uh, and then headed off so that was you know, super super exciting i guess in terms of you know, crazy things that I've seen, I mean, really, it's a bit of a cop out in a, in a way. But this this summer was the craziest thing I've seen. You know, Opal has contingency plans in place for all manners of different things happening. You know, a volcano in Indonesia or a military coup in Honduras or the you know, different things that have happened over the over the years, and we have plans in place. But a scenario where every single project is untenable from every single country in the world um, was just not something that I've ever seen and hopefully won't ever see again in my lifetime. So yeah, the, the, the pressure that that put on uh, the communities that we work with and the projects that we run was was just, you know, un, unbelievable, really. So yeah, a, a, mixed, a mixed bag, but generally there's just been so many, you know, fantastic things that I've, I've seen and done with, with Operation Wallacea. Yeah, well, I do have to say asking people their field stories is usually one of my favorite questions. We get some pretty crazy things out of it. And as much yeah. as you'd love to see black rhino, I'm not sure you'd want to be chased down by them. <laughs> no, it's one of those things. It's a great story and um, fantastic to sort of bank that memory. But of course, at the time, then the experience is is, is somewhat marred. So, you know, it's a bit, a, bit more, a bit more concerning. Yes. Well, so to get straight into it, obviously, we, we recently talked to Tim Coles, the CEO of Opwall, about how Opwall has been innovating through the pandemic to adapt to this lack of tourism, the total lack of international travel, mm. as you just mentioned. And today we wanted to dig a bit more deeply into one of the areas that we talked about, which is this reforestation project in Sulawesi uh, and some other areas around the world. So I wanted to ask you, could you go into a bit more depth about why Opwall has chosen reforestation as one of the new models for supporting our communities and conservation during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, reforestation is a is a great initiative anyway, and and as, as you sort of you know as you mentioned in the question, um, supporting communities through this pandemic is a, a really important part of what Opwal have been trying to do, and the ethos of the, the ethos of the organisation. Um, so reforestation makes sense for for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, just from the community perspective, because when you're doing reforesting, there's a lot of labor, a lot of work involved. And so that means that you can employ quite a lot of people to, to do it. Secondly, it happens around areas where we've got rural communities because, you know, by nature, it's, it's places where you're close to, to forest or you're in um, rural and, and low income areas. But on a more general sense, reforestation is a, an absolute sort of key solution uh, for protection of biodiversity and it, it, you know it really works very very well on the ground so there was a, a nature paper a few years ago that established quite nicely that uh, exploitation of land so things like logging you know la change of land use was the major factor um, driving species extinction so if you care about biodiversity you want to protect biodiversity then reforestation is an absolutely you know amazing way of doing that um, by changing of you know, changing land use from general agriculture into uh, you know into into forested or wild areas and then there's this you know colossal side benefit as well i say it's a side benefit it, it isn't really it's also it's, it's pretty central and that is all around the, the the carbon benefit that you get from doing reforestation so not only are you supporting local communities but you're also protecting wildlife and 
trees sequester carbon dioxide. And so that means that when, if you're interested and concerned about climate change, then this is also a, a hugely beneficial things to do. So there was a, around a similar time to the, na the nature paper I was talking about, there was a paper um, in science that was looking at all of the available land for reforestation in the world. So it looked at, you know, in a global scale, areas that could sustain forests and would be available, i.e., um, you know, were not being used for other things um, like buildings and cities and people's houses and things like that. And if you were to reforest all of those areas, it's about 0.9 billion hectares. If you were to refore uh, reforest that area, then you would be sequestering around about 205 gigatons of, uh, of, of carbon, which I know is just a massive figure, doesn't seem to mean much, but 305 gigatons is the, the total global carbon debt. So, you know, the, the, the total amount of carbon um, that we need to, to sort of balance out the, um, the misbalance, the problem in the, in the atmosphere. So, you know, two thirds of that, if you were reforesting all of the available land, you could solve, which is a, an incredible statistic. Obviously, it's a really complex thing to do. It's, it's not a simple thing at all. But the potential that reforestation has for climate change, for protection of biodiversity and supporting local communities is absolutely immense. And so you know, we really, really wanted to get this going. And so the, the, the paper that was in science, it didn't really talk about a mechanism for how you actually do it. And so that's what we're doing now is we're actually wanting to get this off the ground and running by looking, by working at an area, working in an area um, in Sulawesi where we're adjacent to protected land, but you've got a lot of farmland which is gradually encroaching into the protected forests. And so by funding the reforestation of these areas, and so that means funding people to not chop down the trees, but also to stop other people coming in and chopping down the trees, so they've got to keep it protected, um, stop it, stopping poachers coming in and hunting, then you're making that land more financially viable for those people than it would be if it was chopped down, if the forests were taken out. So straight away, you're giving an economic incentive, which means, you know, in order to do that, you have to raise money and you've got to be able to provide a benefit from, from those forests. And that's where Opwell comes in, because by having these natural areas, these forests, then it means that we can, we can help communities to generate income, whether that's from tourism or other opportunities, then we can, you know, we're, we're there to help with that but you've got to get going with it so you've got to actually get the the trees up and planted um and so that's you know that's that's the process that we're in right now could you maybe explain you know exactly how the reforestation project we're doing in Sulawesi works who are the people planting the trees and, and where are we planting them yeah so it's in, a, in an area of Sulawesi adjacent to um some some national forest reserves it's quite close to some of the areas that Opwell have been uh working in the past um, on this island called Bhutan. Um, and the, so the people are the communities around the area. So we've been working with a lot of these, um, these teams for, for many years. We started working in Sulawesi back in the late 90s. So these are people that we know very well, um, that we've you know, helped as much as we can, but also who have helped us hugely over the years uh, in, in running these projects and bringing their you know, phenomenal expertise about the natural world to projects that have been a massive part of you know hundreds thousands of, of volunteers um lives so you know we're we're really passionate about trying to do what we can because uh, you know this time then there's there's no governmental support on anything like the scale that we see uh, that, that we see here so the idea of the project is that you're you know, directly employing families to help with the planting the growth of the trees the maintenance of them um, and indeed the the protection of the area. So we're you know, logging all of the different people that are involved. So anybody that helps contribute to the project, helps to donate, can actually see those see those people. They can see who, whose lives are, are being affected by, by something like this. Great. So keeping in mind that this is not a carbon credit program, although we have other carbon credit programs and we'll go into that soon. Um, so keeping that in mind, how can individuals get involved in supporting our reforestation efforts in Sulawesi. Sure, and I'll talk a bit later about the you know, carbon credits, but at, at this stage, we are really just looking for donations to help us get the trees planted so that we can um, you know, potentially go to the next stage with things like credits. But in order for us to do that, then 
what we would like is for people to donate and to do that and um, to make the difference to these communities and and have the other benefits um, you can do that at the Wallace Ear Trust website so it's just www.wallaceartrust.org and there's a, a button for donate and so if you go to there then you can you can make a donation there's lots of different ways of, of doing it but the main one is just through the through the website and so if you want to you can then look at your carbon footprint to get an idea of you know you know, roughly how much money you want to you want to donate so you can do that as well there's lots of places out there where you where you can go online go to these carbon calculators and they'll tell you what your you know, annual carbon footprint is what we're suggesting people do um, or asking for is to if you're prepared to donate ten dollars then that will cover two trees those two trees over about a 20 year period will be sequestering somewhere around about a ton of CO2. And so if you want to then you know, pair that with your, uh, with your carbon footprint, then you absolutely can. So we're, we're really wanting people to just you know, go online and to just click the donate button to, to, in order to support the project. Fantastic. Well, that sounds very easy to do. And obviously, you know, it's the price of maybe a latte and a half uh, to plant two trees and support the communities that are, are planting these trees. So obviously we have this very kind of individual uh, citizen-based project, but as we mentioned before, Oppal is also looking into more formalized carbon credit systems. So before we get into what we're doing, could you explain a little bit about how carbon credits work? Because I think a lot of that can get confusing very quickly. Definitely, it's a, it's a confusing topic. Um, so a ton of CO2 is one carbon credit. So if you buy a credit, which you can do on, say, the voluntary carbon markets, there's numerous places you can go. What that means is that one ton of CO2 is being sequestered, i.e. removed from the, from the atmosphere, you know, changed into carbon, locked into a, into a tree, something like that as carbon. So you're buying a credit, you are sequestering one ton of CO2. And what that means is that either there's a project somewhere that is got some trees being planted that are, are then you know, pulling that out of the atmosphere, or there's a project running somewhere that is preventing one ton of CO2 from being released. So the, the idea of a credit is that it is you know, buying back carbon, so removing carbon from the atmosphere um, and, and locking it in or sequestering it. And of course, the the devil with any of these things is in the details because the concept like that, it sounds quite simple, but to actually get to that stage where you've got a project that can sequester carbon and that people can pay for is very, very complicated. So if you're wanting to you know, buy up your carbon credits, then for a start, you've got to buy them. You need to buy them from somewhere where you've got registered accredited carbon credits. And there's a couple of different accreditation bodies who will look at projects and certify them to say yep these projects are going to produce x amount of carbon they're going to sequester x amount of carbon dioxide over a period of however long and therefore we'll offer these credits that can be purchased so that is you know very tightly regulated and through the and through the the voluntary carbon markets so in essence Carbon credits are a way in which people can remove carbon dioxide, um, you know, harmful greenhouse gas, um, from the environment. And by doing that, you're supporting projects like this one or like, pro like projects where you are doing reforestation. Not all carbon credits are reforestation credits. I should, I should clarify that. Um, so if you're buying a carbon credit, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are getting a ton of CO2 by somebody planting a tree somewhere. That ton of CO2 could have been produced by a project where say you have a wind farm and the owners of that wind farm are saying that by generating X amount of electricity from wind, they are preventing the carbon emissions that would have come from burning the equivalent amount of fossil fuels to get the same level of electricity. And so there's these different types of credits that you can buy, but in essence, one ton of CO2 is one carbon credit. 
that's the that's the key message really that um, that you need. All right, thank you. That's nice, simple response of how this works. It's obviously an extremely complex system that still is in the process of being really fully built out. I think the infrastructure for carbon credits is, is relatively young um, mm -hmm. and it's an area where there's room for a lot of innovation. So beginning, before getting into how Opal is innovating here with, with the carbon credit model, I know you talked a bit about individuals offsetting their carbon footprint. Is this something that, that companies are also doing? So when something like Microsoft or Apple talks about net zero emissions, are they buying carbon credits? Absolutely. So the, the when you can when you're purchasing carbon credits, you can do it through the voluntary carbon markets um, as an individual, and so lots of companies do that, which means that they're not obliged to. They don't have to buy carbon credits to offset their emissions, but they'll they'll do it anyway because they realise the value of it. But there's also some compulsory emission reduction targets that certain companies, you know, really big ones, have to meet. So there are some you know compulsory purchases as well for, for carbon credits to reduce emissions. But it's not just companies that are committing to you know, going net zero and doing things like that. In 2015, you had the Paris Accord where countries from all around the world made pledges that would see their CO2 emissions reduce in a way that would you know, drastically slow the current increase in global temperatures. And that was a, a really important moment even though those pledges are not legally binding, there's still this culture now that all countries are, well, not all countries, but the vast majority of countries are now committing to making these changes at a national level. And so that will you know, keep on driving carbon offsetting at a business level from the, you know, the, the capital markets right down to, you know, we're seeing pledges from countries to stop producing cars that run on diesel and, uh, and gasoline by 2030 in the UK's case, for example. So there's lots of things like that that mean that there's just going to be more and more of a drive for people and companies to either offset their emissions or to engage in more environmentally friendly consumer behavior. Great and optimistic. I hope we do see a world like that in the near future. So how is Opwall specifically innovating on this existing carbon credit model that obviously requires a lot more infrastructure than just the reforestation side? So, yeah, so we're, we're looking at some other, um, quite a few carbon credit models at the moment. One of the limiting factors on carbon credits is that in order to get your carbon credits, then you need to actually get your trees planted or do something or other like that in order to, to, to generate the sequestration of, of, of carbon dioxide. And there's, of course, a, a cost attached to that. So you've got to actually get there. You've got to be able to you know, somehow find the funding to plant a load of trees or to establish a project or to do something like that. So it's not something that you can just you know, start up and quickly sell carbon credits for. But one of the big issues really comes down to how much carbon a credit agency um, will allow for a given project. And so they'll have a look at your trees or they'll have a look at what it is that you're doing and they'll make an estimation of how much carbon dioxide is going to be saved or sequestered over the life of the project. And based on that, they'll assign a number of credits. So if they'll say, well, in this hectare of, of forest, over a 10-year period, you're going to sequester uh, 100 tons of carbon, then you, you've then got your 100, uh, your 100 credits. So that all works um, quite nicely. But there's a couple of really important uh, scientific developments that we're working with that can make a really big difference to this. The first of those is that there are a couple of environments where the, the total carbon sequestered is much, much higher than the standard calculation methods will allow. And the reason for that is that in two particular environments, uh, mangroves and peat forests, so these sort of boggy environments, when leaf litter falls, when things fall on the, fall on the floor, if that happens in a rainforest, then the rain washes it away. Um, and so broken down leaf litter, twigs, things like that will oxidize. Uh, and so what you've got is then the carbon going back into the environment. Whereas with mangroves and peat forests, that doesn't happen because you've got this wet sort of boggy 
uh, anoxic layer of sediment that stops that oxidization process. And so that means that the carbon accumulates and keeps accumulating in the soil. But there isn't really an easy way at the moment in the, in the methods used by the different credit agencies to be able to give what we think is the proper value for the carbon contained in those soils. Because if you, if you do chop down a load of mangroves or you drain a, a, a peat forest, for example, then all of that locked in carbon ends up oxidizing and goes back into the, into the atmosphere. So it's a huge amount. So these projects are projects with mangroves and peat forests. There's this huge sort of untapped potential for recognition of the carbon credit value there. But in order to get that, what you have to do is you have to get scientific agreement and you've got to get a method where you can reliably say, well, this is how much carbon is actually there and this is how much would be lost if this area was deforested. Or if you're replanting mangroves, say, this is how much is going to accumulate over a long period of time. And to do that is complex. So it, it means it, it really is using all of Opwell's resources and abilities to connect with the, the best scientists that can make the best case for how you do this, how you can work out a very scientifically sound method that will be accepted at the level it's needed uh, in order to be able to get certification from these you know, international credit bodies. So what we're doing at the moment is developing that method. And that's something that is happening as we speak, even we're, we're you know, re reviewing different drafts and, and getting ourselves to that point. Well, I was about to ask you how you actually calculate how much carbon <laughs> is stored. Um, it sounds like obviously it depends on the environment specifically, but you know, obviously we, we're basing this off of a one, one ton of carbon per two trees or yep. you know, a ton of carbon in a certain space. So obviously we might not have the, the systems for calculating in peat forests or mangrove forests, but how do we calculate how much carbon is stored in a forest that we do know a bit more about? And, and then also how do we ensure that they stay protected? How do you make sure they're not cut down, burned, turned yep. into timber or what else, you know, 20 years later? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I should start by saying that quite a few people have done calculations of, of carbon sequestration and carbon storage in mangroves and peat forests. And there's there's lots of data on that. But um, what we're doing, doing is sort of combining lots and lots of different research on sequestration rates as well as storage in order to, to try to get a full recognition of that of that value. Uh, and that's sort of the, the, the approach that we're taking when it comes to working out how much carbon is in a forest is in a tree or something like that then how do you do it it's the answer is it's it's, it's fairly complicated but it's it's doable and what you do if you're if you're doing um i guess a tropical forest then what you need to do first of all is to start by looking at the the total weight of the trees so you have formulas that you can use where you're looking at things like diameter height of the trees You'll then multiply that by a coefficient that will take into account the average below ground biomass for things like roots for those trees. And that will be dependent on the species. So you need to know what the species are. And when you've got that, you've then got a calculation that you use to get to the dry weight of the tree. So because the, the first thing you're doing is calculating the, the full weight or the green weight. So, again, that's something that will be based on various coefficients that are worked out. Um, you've got different formulas that you can use um, that are fairly well established. And then when you've got that dry weight, you then have to calculate the carbon weight from the dry weight. And it's usually about 50% from, from, from one to another. So once you've then got the carbon weight, then that gives you the, the, the volume or the amount of carbon that's going to be uh, st that is stored at present in that, in that environment. And then when you're looking at these projects, you also need to have a look at how much carbon is going to be sequestered over the life of that tree. So you then have to factor in things like the likelihood of lightning strikes or anything else that could mean that, you know, all of the carbon goes. So there's, there's lots of things to, to take into account, but there are fairly well established methods for working out what carbon is there already. It gets much more difficult when you're then making guesses about how much carbon is going to be there in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time. Sounds like there's a lot of math involved and maybe a lot of <laughs> scientists involved. So if a community has a piece of forest uh, somewhere, mm. you know, owns it, how might they go about, could they go about a process of, you know, measuring the amount of carbon that's in it and trying to get it 
certified to to get payments and and actually protect it? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, could they measure it? Absolutely. So um, there is a lot of maths involved, but there's a lot of measuring. So that's why I get something that also lends itself quite nicely to to Opwell groups because doing ground truthing for this sort of thing is is quite labor intensive. Could a community before you, before you go on, I'll just ask you if you could define ground truthing for us really quickly for anyone who might uh, not know what that means. Yeah, sure. So when I talk about ground truthing, I'm talking about actually measuring things on the ground. So we're not just looking at a satellite image of the trees and saying, oh, yeah, there's 100 hectares of trees. On average, these trees will sequester this amount of carbon and store this amount of carbon. That's a, a really good place to start from. But when you're wanting to get down to the level of really giving you know, accurate and and verifiable amounts of carbon in a given area then you have to ground truth which means sending people in to actually measure the trees at least in a sample and so you're, you've got people actually measuring the diameters um, of the different trees measuring the heights um, and doing doing that sort of doing that sort of work perfect i think that's going to sound quite familiar to a lot of uh, up all alumni who spent <laughs> long periods of time wrapping measuring tapes around trees in the middle of the rainforest yeah, absolutely. But yeah, in answer to your question, if a, if a community has an area of forest and they want to they want to be able to get payments for it on the carbon markets, well, that's a that's an interesting one. In order in order to do that, then what you've sort of got to do is is to is to show that there is going to be carbon sequestration or prevention of carbon emissions that wouldn't have otherwise occurred. So, if it's a forest that they already own and they're not allowed to chop it down because it's protected forest or something like that, then you're not going to be able to get any additionality, any additional carbon from it. Whereas if you've got a, you know, an area of land that doesn't have anything on it right now, and you want to, to replant it and say, actually, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to protect this forest, then yes, you can, in theory, if you've got a big enough area and you're able to, to do it and to get the trees planted and to protect them and you're able to do the measurements and things like that, then yes, you can do it. The, the difficulty really is that in order to get credits, in order to get your project certified, it's a long process and you need a lot of upfront investment. You know, when you're looking at getting, say, you know, 100, 200 hectares even uh, of forest, which is you know, not a huge amount of land really in the scheme of things, and just the cost involved of purchasing trees, planting trees, ensuring that nobody else is going to come and cut those trees down, and then having your, your credit body, your credit agency coming out and assessing the project, putting the time and the, the effort into actually making sure you've got a really robust case for why this area is going to sequester carbon that wouldn't otherwise be sequestered, then uh, that's a that's a, a difficult step situation to get to it takes a lot of effort and input and that's one of the you know one of the, the main problems really with um with that with that model is getting to that stage where carbon credits can be assigned right well obviously it looks like also a big opportunity for you know startups and people in tech to maybe dive in and find a way to make the barriers to entry to this market a lot lower i know they are to some extent but certainly it seems mm. like you now there's a lot of areas of forest and a lot of communities protecting them that could potentially be making hopefully a lot of money to, to protect those areas. Well, that, that's it. So if you think about the, you know, the financial model of it, then really what you're talking about is somehow monetizing um, reforestation or you know, monetizing the, the carbon value there. So we're putting a financial value on a natural resource. And that's a, a, a complex enough concept in itself. But what the carbon credit system does is it allows that monetization. Because if you think about it, then by reforesting an area, if, you're, if, you're, if I'm an investor and I'm paying for loads of uh, reforesting, then what that means is if, if I do that in a way where it's going to be credited, then I get a product from it. So I get something, you know, I get a, a carbon credit that I can sell. And so there is the financial ability to actually pay for these projects and then, you know, make enough money for it to, for it to work out financially. Of course, the, there's always risk involved because you've got to get there and you've got to be able to actually generate the credits and all those sorts of things. But what Opwell is doing really is by un uncovering the idea of being able to generate a lot more carbon from a given area in terms of credits, then that can make something like this massively more attractive to an investor. 
because it means that they can actually see a, a return. So they're not just doing it out of you know philanthropic desire to protect the environment, but there's actually a, a financial model that can drive it as well. And that's a hugely powerful thing. In addition to that, then you've also got you know government targets and and those sorts of pressures that are placed on companies and on investors and so on that can help to drive it. So the the, the financial side of carbon models and carbon trading is is absolutely critical and, and what we think really is is likely to be the the future of reforestation is this combined commitment from different countries for protection of forests but also incentives for private investment to actually get projects like this working so that carbon credits can be sold well that's all very exciting and i i just have one more question for you about carbon and reforestation before we kind of <clears throat> finish up. So yeah, no there's a there's a lot of projects right now around the world talking about planting trees, you know, planting a tree for every transaction, planting a trillion yep. trees. We've all heard about mm -hmm. them. You know, why should we be skeptical about those kinds of, of projects or should we be skeptical of those kinds mm -hmm. of projects? Or in particular, kind of why is it important to pay attention to what species are being planted in these reforestation projects, even at a, a massive scale? Well, to answer the the question about skepticism, should we be skeptical? I think it's healthy to be skeptical of anything that's happening like this. It's always you know, healthy to answer, uh, to ask questions about how those trees are being funded, um, what species they are, who's actually going to be doing the replanting, where the money is going. That's all you know, absolutely a, a good idea to be skeptical. In general, if we're just interested in carbon, then planting trees is a good thing. Okay, so, you know, if all we care about is getting carbon dioxide converted to carbon, then excellent, let's just, you know, plant loads of trees. But of course, the counter argument to that is, well, does, is, it, is it still okay to plant coffee or palm oil and all those things? And that also, you know, comes into the carbon credit model, because you can get carbon credits for that sort of, that, those sorts of plantations, because there is still carbon being sequestered. But of course, for the environment, that's not so that's not so good. But because if you're planting palm oil or coffee, there's a product that you can sell, then it pushes the price of the credit down because you can you know, run your project on a much lower overhead because you're also getting income from your um, from your crop. So what we're doing, though, is focusing on projects where you're planting native species. And you know, critically, it's things that would and should be growing in that environment anyway. Because if you do that, then you've got additional benefits to biodiversity. So there's nature protection as well, which isn't there so much when you've got these other, other types of crops. So that's a, that's a pretty important point. And a lot of carbon projects now will look at additionality or they will look at um, what other benefits there are from, from planting up and they'll tr you know, try and try and monetize that. But certainly I wouldn't say to be, you know, entirely skeptical of everything, but it's certainly worth looking into. And it's it's worth being aware that any reforestation project isn't the same as a, a reforestation project where you're focusing on native species, where there's a, a specific goal to protect wildlife as well. I think that's a great point. And I might not have asked that question uh, perfectly, but I do think obviously your point is you know, it is worth paying attention to what trees are being planted. Just planting a tree, yes, it does good, but it doesn't do necessarily as much good as a native tree or a different kind of project that's more appropriate for the area. Um, yeah, that, that's it. And, and, you know, that, and I guess in a sense, that's kind of, you see that reflected in price of carbon credits, you know? So right. if you're looking at buying credits from, say, you know, wind farms or something like that, then because there's an output, because there's an ele electrical there's electricity being produced then it means that the credit cost is actually really quite low because right. the the owner of the farm is able to get an income say and and with um you know coffee or palm oil that sort of thing then again you can get credits and they're, they're not so expensive if you're looking for natural forest regeneration credits then they tend to be much more expensive because there's there's less opportunities other than the carbon for the um for the the project owner to be able to actually you know, generate generate income from it. So a key goal, I suppose, in the future, a, a dream is to be able to somehow quantify 
the biodiversity benefit and to be able to monetize that to be able to I mean, monetizing it sounds horrifically capitalist but what i mean is to, to somehow be able to say well because you're you know, protecting this number of species then there needs to be a recognition of financial value to that which is reflected in the price of the uh, of, of the credit right that makes a lot of sense well, to end us out on a positive note, I wanted to ask you why you personally believe we should keep fighting to protect biodiversity and prevent climate change, and really, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Okay, well, that's a big question. Um, why should we? Why should we keep fighting to protect biodiversity and, and prevent climate change? I think that when you have the chance to see what's happening all around the world, when you go on Opal expeditions, that gives you an opportunity to do that, but you know, from any other walk of life, then what you can see is that we're surrounded by a phenomenal planet. And so just protecting that, I think, is inherently important. Once you once you see it, then you always will want to want to help protect it. I think that the the problems from climate change are incredibly real. That's not just something which is an abstract concept. It's not just about the world being a a less ideal place with with less of these lovely animals around you know we're seeing the economic pandemonium that is you know caused as the climate is uh, climate is changing so as a a species who are almost by definition caring and interested in social interactions then i think that humans have got a job if we want to be human then we have to care for other humans and we have to care for more than just ourselves because that is something that is, you know, absolutely fundamental to, to our existence. Uh, and so I think that just to be a human, you know, you, you have to make some consideration to the environment and to, um, and, and to climate change because it helps other people and it helps the you know, other species as well. In terms of what gets me out of bed in the morning. So I think for me, what, what gets me out of bed really is the idea that, actually there are all these really positive steps being made not just at the local level but at governmental levels and within the capital markets in order to to recognize and protect biodiversity and the planet uh, and so i think that we're you know we're we're on a we're on a, a tidal shift at the moment there's definitely a change in direction you know i've seen i've been working for opwell now for uh, 15 years just over and without a doubt the the recognition now that we see from the general public from you know, general people about the importance of the environment has changed cata you know cataclysmically like it's just so different now to what it was 10 10 15 years ago and that change in itself is exciting but i think that what we've got to come is going to be brilliant you know we've got cop 26 coming this year i think that there's going to be um, so many more policy changes that impact the way that everybody interacts with the uh, the environment around them. I think that being part of that change is is just really, really exciting. Well, that's a fantastic way for us to finish out. And I'm glad to hear that the thing that doesn't that, that wakes you up isn't your son, Albi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as my last question, just wanted to ask you what you're most looking forward to for our next field season. Oh. Well, wow, that's a, a tricky one. I think that I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing the seeing some of the environments that we've been working in for many years, and you come to sort of take for granted that you can visit these places and you can uh, experience that environment as part of your you know, reality. Whereas, of course, that's been held back now for for this you know for this year for for twenty twenty, and so I'm I'm just really looking forward to getting into these different environments and seeing where projects like the Sulawesi Reforestation Program and like our surveys all around the world are actually making a difference. Because one of the you know the one of the massive downsides of of um, the pandemic has has meant this sort of slightly more insular approach in that you don't more you don't easily know you can't see you can't visit other places and so being able to do that will i think massively open up those bridges open up 
the the conversations that we haven't had as much as we could have done as we would have done if we'd been in the field last year so i'm just yeah really looking forward to sort of getting out there i suppose well thank you so much for joining us today alex on the podcast it's great to interview you and learn more about carbon credits and obviously what opal is doing in terms of reforestation so i'll let you get on with your day thank you for your time all right no, no worries at all um if i can do a final plug again for wallaceatrust.org then um you know please if anyone is able to donate we'd be very very grateful well thank you so much hopefully we will see your donations uh be able to fund this project it's a it's a really exciting project to be able to support biodiversity and, and local communities in this way so thank you for listening and uh thanks for joining thank you for tuning in to opwals field notes we hope you learned something new about carbon credits and reforestation in this episode with opwal operations director alex tozer a special thanks to our podcast producer, Mike Judson, and our editor, Beth Newark, who make this and every episode possible. Make sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episodes about conservation and biodiversity hotspots around the world coming soon on Apple's Field Notes. <laughs>